Good morning, everybody. And uh, uh, it's very nice to see so many people here this morning. Some of you attended uh, yesterday's concert in St. Mary's Church. And uh, there we had uh, poems and prayers by Lars Bjørklund. And I want to quote some of them as an introduction to this lecture or, or talk. I think of everybody who is in prison for what they see, think and write. For they see the abuse and write and write and write. It's a privilege for me as head of culture here in Sigtuna to introduce to you Mr. Rajiv Sarakulu, guest writer of Sigtuna, and Mr. Ola Larsmo, head of Swedish Pen. It's really nice of you to use the expression head of Swedish Pan because I've had some trouble with the title there for a while. <laughs> president sounds too presidential. Uh, and I asked the president of Pan International if I couldn't call myself chairman instead. But he said, no, that sounds too much like Chairman Mao. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I'm also very happy to be here again in Sigtuna. And I think there are two really, really important questions that we should address here this morning. Uh, the uh, title of this little speech is Silences in History. And I think that's the first and, and really fascinating subject that we should deal with. Uh, I myself, I am always totally, totally fascinated by these silences in history. And by that I mean the things that we're not supposed to talk about. There's always, in every society, there are topics, there are things that have happened that we're not supposed to talk about. And I have myself written a number of books now on, on uh, Swedish right-wing extremism and anti-Semitism during World War II. So that's one topic that has fascinated me. Another topic that Ragip has been dealing very much with is, is the Armenia genocide in Turkey end of World War One, And that's another silence, not just in Turkey, but also in Swedish history. We have had real huge problems politically addressing this, uh, which is the genocide that actually created the term genocide. Uh, as you might know, our foreign minister, Mr. Kolbit, didn't want us to talk about that. He didn't want us to call it genocide in a formal meaning, because that might cause diplomatic problems with Turkey. So this is uh, one of those silences that we share in a way, that we have a hard time addressing. And there are many other examples of these kind of silences. And as a writer, I mean that if you look into these silences in history, the topics you're not supposed to talk about, you always find a huge and fascinating story. There's always one of the big, powerful stories there. Uh, and once you go into that closed room, you might never even get out because it's so fascinating and important what you find there. If you find the time later on, I think we should also talk a little bit about the icon system since Raoul is here as, as a guest of Sittuna and uh, the Icon Foundation. But that is if, if the silences of history lets us get that far. So I asked Raoul this morning if he could tell us a little bit about what you can <coughs> talk about in Turkey and about what kind of problems you have had when you have addressed these topics, like, for instance, the Armenian genocide. Thank you. Uh, at the beginning, uh, I was also uh, alien to the Armenian genocide issue uh, because for me, too, uh, it was a historical alien and sometimes it was hard to understand why Armenians uh, so insist. Uh, but uh, after what happened in Turkey in 1990, afterwards in Bosnia, afterwards uh, in Africa, Rwanda, and last in 
Suda, uh, I had the consciousness uh, more deeply uh, how the genocide issue is actual in the world. Now, uh, we are uh, witnessing by means of uh, TVs there was a, another danger of the genocide in the Middle East against uh, non-Muslims. Also inside the Muslim, uh, different uh, uh, groups, different factions accept each other as threat. And uh, lastly, the Yazidi people of uh, our uh, Kurdish uh, origin was a, a real danger genocide. It's very really interesting uh, uh, for me because uh, I had uh, many uh, testimonies about uh, uh, the region, that region where SDB people in danger now. In 1915 there was during the Armenian uh, genocide uh, the Yazidi people uh, accepted uh, Armenian orphans to the Sinjar mountains. And after 100 years, 99 years later, uh, these people uh, were in danger by genocide. And so it shows uh, genocide is actual in this world today also. Also, Denial is a danger for the future of uh, humanity. And it's also a danger, denial is also a danger for my country. It's a danger for the future of uh, uh, Turkey. Because if we don't face uh, with our own history, always there will be a danger to repeat uh, these events. Because in our society, there is also a big uh, uh, polarization uh, between uh, political Islam, between nationalism, also uh, the Kurdish question. So the, the best way uh, is uh, to face with the history. I don't think that everyone in this room perhaps are familiar with the background in Turkey. Why is it really so hard in Turkey to address the issue of the Armenian genocide? If you could just give us a little short background there. Uh, Turkey, uh, not totally totalitarian, but it was a, a country that has a totalitarian, totalitarian heritage strong. We have uh, national uh, stories, we have uh, uh, national uh, history. A proud of, we are very proud of our history, uh, but uh, after the education uh, nearly 80 years, uh, you can see another phase of the history. And also, it's not good for uh, your pride uh, as, uh, as, Islam, as a Turk, also as a Kurd. Uh, so, general people didn't want to listen uh, these uh, stories. Also, there is another uh, factor. Um, Turkey always wanted to gain time. Everybody knows what happened in 1915. It's a partly absurd to discuss it is genocide or not uh, genocide. So it is also uh, defaming uh, the victims after 100 years. We are uh, discussing uh, how can we define? Oh, it was was it uh, ethnic cleansing or genocide? Uh, and we are very happy when Obama said uh, uh, it is disaster or. Uh, big tragedy. So what is uh, for our pride? It's good. Uh, this is defined not genocide, although Mr. Obama defined it as a tragedy <coughs> or a disaster uh, or massacre. Uh, but uh, the mentality behind of this denial is to gain time. Only gain time because after acknowledgement of the genocide, uh, there will be another step discussing of reparation, for example. So if you prevent, uh, you prevent the process at the beginning, so at least you will win uh, 50 years. Like Kurdish question, Turkey denied 
night uh, existence of the Turks uh, more than 50 years. Now Turkey accepted, uh, but uh, they win at least uh, 50 years. So it is a little uh, Machiavellian uh, policy. It's a game for time, I said, yes. as you say. And you published the first book on, on the Armenian issue in 93, I think you yes. told me. What happened? Uh, we published the book and uh, we went home every, from the publishing house and uh, uh, we prayed a little. <laughs> Hopefully we can uh, survive uh, something. And one year later our uh, publishing uh, house was born. Our publishing house uh, wasn't formed uh, when we published books, first books. It was also at the first beginning in 1990, but Kurdish We had trials, <coughs> problems, our writers were arrested, but we didn't afraid so much. But after uh, the Armenian genocide issue, uh, we afraid. And we were very alone inside the Turkish intelligentsia also. For example, we had solidarity, huge solidarity about the books, uh, about Kurdish question from Turkish intellectuals. But when we publish uh, about Armenian genocide 93, yeah. there was no, only we have international, uh, had only international solidarity. So who was it that bombed your book company? Do you know that now? Who was well, behind that? Uh, behind of that, uh, later the, uh, the government published a report about the uh, Susuruk event. Uh, it was a part of the paramilitary of the state, deep state, and uh, we opened a trial against the government. <coughs> uh, five years ago, we win it, and we had a, a little uh, reparation. Uh, not uh, big, but at the end we win. Uh, because also state accepted the government of responsibility with a high level of report uh, during the crisis in 1996, they accept this. But you said that when you wrote about the Kurdish issue and published books about uh, the Kurdish situation, you could get some support from other Turkish intellectuals. Yes. But how come then that the Armenian issue is even more sensitive because uh, the nationalism uh, was uh, strong uh, inside our intellectuals also. For example, uh, you know Yashar Kemal, he was a candidate of Nobel Prize, and uh, he talked about the uh, Kurdish question in 95. Uh, and uh, he was put uh, in trial, and there was a huge campaign uh, to solidarity with Yashar Kemal. And, uh, and uh, Orhan Pamuk and others uh, declared uh, they repeat the sentences uh, and they were accused also because before that. And we had the trial about Armenian genocide, we were alone. And next uh, place there was a trial, solidarity with Yashar Kemal, and nobody came uh, to observe our uh, trial. And I asked uh, to put a piece of the uh, Armenian Genocide book, because they publish a book as Turkish intellectuals uh, about Kurdish question, other uh, banned books, and they declare we sign the sentences uh, and uh, we are responsible. And they were put in trial. But uh, when we ask uh, to take a part of the Armenian Genocide, and uh, they didn't accept, and uh, they explained this, uh, some intellectual uh, could change their signature from this uh, solidarity campaign. Mm. But uh, after 20 years, uh, the last uh, five years, in Istanbul it, 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 it is possible now uh, to organize commemoration uh, 24th uh, April, uh, like all the international centers of the world. I'm very happy because uh, first commemoration made in Istanbul, 1919, uh, during the last Ottoman government, and uh, but later uh, it's not possible to commemorate by Armenian community. And uh, today also, uh, not Armenian community, but uh, human rights.
organized organizations and some other political groups organize commemoration because the Armenian community is anxious. As you, as you say, things have lightened up a little bit. Some things are possible to discuss today. You have a lot of other problems with freedom of speech in, in Turkey today. But I don't mean you to, to sort of uh, give yourself a pat on the back here, but would it have been possible at all to talk about the Armenian issue in Turkey today if there hadn't been like an intellectual resistance? Uh, yes, after uh, uh, in t 20 years, especially after the Grantings uh, murder, uh, because it was a, a breaking point, uh, and uh, uh, now it's possible to talk about Armenian genocide. Also, it pushed government uh, backward, and uh, it's very important. Uh, this year, first time, a, a Turkish Prime Minister uh, published uh, a condolence message about Armenian genocide. After 99 years, at least uh, we could uh, do uh, condolence. It's too late, but it's not so. It's a beginning. And even if these things are, are brightening up a bit, as you said, uh, the Kurdish question is now how can the area can use the Kurdish language in, in today's Turkey? You can also address the Armenian genocide issue. But then we get other strange reports coming out of Turkey. I mean, last summer I think there was a trial against publishers who had been publishing books by, for instance, William Burroughs yeah. in Turkey. So even if these things are opening up a bit, what kind of threats do you see today uh, against freedom of speech? Yes, uh, uh, you know, uh, we have a, a conservative uh, political Islam uh, government now, so uh, they are uh, better than nationalist governments against minority questions, about Kurdish question, about Armenian genocide issue, but uh, they are not uh, so uh, good uh, about, uh, for example, I, all my life uh, was full of struggle against a different kind of taboos, militarism, nationalism, uh, Greek issue, Armenian issue, anti-Semitism. But I think now uh, the most courageous uh, writer uh, can be uh, uh, a writer who can dare uh, to critics to criticize uh, Islam or religion uh, so now I'm, I'm also uh, uh, I didn't do that until now uh, because uh, there were other priorities also uh, the Islam uh, community was uh, had problems uh, with the traditional state of Turkey, uh, so it, there was no priority. But now, uh, with uh, growing authoritarianism, uh, we need to discuss uh, the Islam and the religion in Turkey, especially what happened during the last one year in Syria and Iraq, because of the. Uh, growing of a kind of Islamofascism. So, so if we sum this up, uh, what you're saying is that during the more secular reign in Turkey, you had silences that you couldn't address that dealt with history. And today you mean that uh, the new silence that you can't address is about religion. Yes. Also conservatism. Also the sex uh, became a taboo. Uh, there are as publisher associations where we made a struggle to change the laws we were successful about the heretical uh, literature. Uh, but there is a resistance to go on to uh, ban or to, to put in charge the publishers about heretical uh, literature. For example, uh, Apollinaire, famous uh, French poet and writer in trial now, so you can't publish Apollinaire in today's <laughs> Turkey? Uh, uh, sure, poetry possible, but uh, not theoretical books. Uh, it's problematic. Uh, one uh, book of him uh, was banned 
15 years ago. Uh, uh, later it was banned and uh, convicted. Later publisher uh, went to Strasbourg and uh, they will uh, they win. Uh, later after 15 years another Apollinaire after the decision of the Strasbourg court again put in trial. Because this is something that you might have to explain to us. Uh, I can understand why a government might not want to talk about atrocities that have been committed in the past, mm -hmm. like a genocide. But I find it very hard to understand why you ban books by William Burroughs. Uh, I mean, how, how can he represent a threat to, to the state in Turkey today? And what's, what's so dangerous about these kind of translated classics? Yeah. So, uh, like uh, all uh, authoritarian uh, politicians, they want to impose uh, their lifestyle to the society instead of uh, accept uh, pluralism, different uh, communities, different kind of cultures, and it is the base of the uh, real democracy. But they suppose if we win the elections, if we got 51% uh, of the votes, so we can uh, give uh, shape, form to the society. So what is the difference uh, with uh, Assad in Syria? Why everybody was against uh, Assad? Uh, Turkey is a part of a Western system, uh, 60 years, a part of the NATO, and uh, they declare they share the European values and uh, but what kind of uh, going now? If, if we just talk a little bit more <coughs> about your own experiences uh, perhaps you don't want to give us all the details but I know that you have had a lot of problems with, with the authorities like you have been imprisoned and you have had books banned and so on how would you say the situation is today? Could you go home and um, publish your books freely? Uh, yes, uh, but uh, with the risks, as usual. Always, we, as publisher and writer, uh, we're always on the border. So, uh, we didn't accept auto-censorship and <coughs> limit ourselves. Sure, we had to limit ourselves uh, some periods, especially during the, uh, under the military government, because we tried to publish under the military government uh, the history or academic book about the history of Turkish left, and there was a policy of annihilation against the Turkish left. And then we understand uh, my late wife arrested, put in uh, jail, but that time also we win the trial. Uh, but the military government didn't accept uh, the decision of the court and then the book again. <laughs> uh, but at least we uh, try, always we try. Uh, we don't, uh, we cannot uh, win uh, more uh, freedom without trying. Uh, so we had uh, totally 40 tries because of our uh, books. You said 40. That's four zero, 40 trials. 40 trials, only for the books. Not, uh, I don't say about uh, trials because of the conferences or articles or declarations. Well, would you say that this struggle for freedom of speech is like two steps forward and one step backward? Is it going in the right direction? Uh, yes, it's a typical Ottoman march. <laughs> <laughs> So you said that the main science uh, in today's Turkey then would be to address questions of, of religion and, and faith. But if you look on Europe and, and perhaps Sweden as well, what silences do you see or hear here that, what topics do we have a problem addressing here and now? I think um, the silence is a problem for Europe also. And uh, European countries need to do something against the silence. For example, anti-Semitism in Eastern Europe, growing nationalism and racism in Hungary, Hungary it's a part of European Union. How <laughs> it could be uh, possible? 
uh, and uh, I don't uh, uh, talk about Ukraine. Uh, everybody was uh, critical against uh, the Russians, but there is no enough critics against Ukrainian nationalism and their part during the uh, Holocaust. Uh, and for example, you cannot talk in Ukraine about the, the part of the Ukrainian nationalist during the Holocaust. It's the same with uh, uh, Turkish denial or everybody in the past during the Yugoslavian crisis talk about uh, uh, Serbian ultra-nationalism. It was because it was so visible, but nobody enough critical against Croatian racism and Croatian nationalism you can only have sort of focus on one topic at a time. You, it's too hard to keep two questions in your head at the same time, I yeah. often think. Yeah. We spoke a little bit earlier today about another risk that, that I think we agree on from a PAN perspective. Uh, and as you say, very strange things are happening in, in Hungary, for instance. And the Hungarian Prime Minister had a speech a few weeks ago when he actually said that the days of liberal democracy are numbered, he said. It's the same the discourse with Mr. Erdogan. Yes, and uh, you can see like an alliance growing now between what they call people who want to defend old values, as they say. Mr. Putin in, in Russia has said that he wants to lead an alliance that defends old values. And he has stretched out a hand to Mr. Erdogan. And uh, I think that Hungary is also interested in joining this alliance. Well, this in my eyes, looks like a new kind of threat towards freedom of speech. Yes. And uh, also, uh, anti-Semitism uh, for Turkey is a, a great threat. Uh, it's, uh, I think the Jewish uh, community uh, uh, feel most isolated period in their life because they were uh, always loyal <coughs> to Turkish state and community and they were uh, assimilated deeply but uh, always they paid the uh, price uh, the wrong of the Israeli government and uh, always uh, they like hostage and now uh, in Turkey, uh, the nationalists are anti-Semite because of the uh, Palestinian question. Also, the religious people are anti-Semite, the majority of uh, now anti-Semite. What kind of expression does this anti-Semitism take? Well, what happens really? Well, what are Jewish people experiencing? Especially, uh, in example, there was a boycott against Jewish uh, companies. Uh, who owned the companies owned by the Jewish, Turkish Jewish, and not, not, not Israeli, Israeli, but Tur not Israeli companies, but Jewish companies. Huh? Yeah, the, I mean, there's a difference. You know, Turkish citizens, yeah. but they are uh, they have uh, they are Turks, well, Jewish origin Turks, and so they are listed like Nazi period, mm -hmm. uh, and also we have uh, Mario Levy, one of the famous Turkish writers, uh, one of the best uh, writer. Uh, using Turkish uh, language and he, uh, he was in the list uh, of the boycott because of his origin. So, as, also assimilation is not enough. <laughs> you, were, you weren't supposed to read books by this writer then because he had a Jewish background. Yeah. Because that, that's one of the signs. And in many places uh, he was uh, went in the name of Turkey different uh, book fairs and uh, translated different languages and he is a very humanistic writer and uh, he was put in a uh, boycott list. This is also another example of freedom of expression, not only from the, uh, the, the, the danger it came also from the society, not only from the state. For example, uh, one of my friends, uh, Sevan Nishanya, in, in the prison now. He's a very brilliant intellectual, uh, politologue, and uh, publish dictionaries, write books. Also, he uh, um, 
made a very uh, nice touristic center in an old uh, Greek uh, village in uh, Western Anatolia. And because of uh, he did this, he was put in once in uh, jail instead of to give reward. And they accuse him that you make reparations without permission. Also, it shows they don't want uh, reparations of uh, uh, some uh, Armenian or uh, Greek uh, culture heritage. They weren't uh, so happy uh, because of the nationalist education and culture. And uh, lastly, he was uh, he was popular during Erdogan period because he was very harsh critical of Turkish nationalism, Kemalism. He was a good boy. But when he published uh, a critic against uh, the Islamist circles, he was first fired uh, from the newspaper and he was uh, put in uh, jail now because of so-called uh, construction without permission. So that this, that this is like an excuse to put him in prison that he has been repairing houses without a permit. Yeah. yeah. And uh, you know, uh, if you visit, uh, I think the uh, seventy percent of the Turkish uh, buildings, I think, uh, without permission, yes, and a few more. Houses houses might or, uh, yeah, yeah. I just want to say that that you refer to anti-Semitism as one of the growing problems in, in Turkey today, yes. and and that is what really one of the silences here in Swedish history that I have been trying to address mm -hmm. in some of my books, because when I grew up. Uh, I couldn't even think that we had had anti-Semitism in Sweden. It was so sort of painted out over that part of Swedish history. Uh, so that was a real journey for me to go into that part of Swedish history and uh, find out a lot of rather heinous things that had happened here. And again, as you say, we can see that this package of prejudice is sort of opened again here in Sweden as well. So I quite agree with you. That's one of the growing problems in, in Europe today. Yes, and it's very important, uh, your contribution, so do you mind? <laughs> <laughs> We're going to discuss that a little bit later this day again. Uh, but we have a few minutes left and I wanted to just say a few things about the icon system. Yes, uh, what is your experience uh, from being uh, sort of a writer in the icon system? Uh, icon uh, system, very important. Also, it's very uh, connected with uh, international pen tradition. During the Nazi period, international uh, pen helped so much to German writers. For example, uh, one of them uh, was uh, James Joyce, who was a, a Swiss servant, yes. and he was accepted uh, an authority by Swiss authorities. And uh, Musil, Robert Musil, one of the greatest writers of German literature, uh, wanted to come after the Anschluss of Austria to uh, uh, Switzerland and then the Swiss government asked James Joyce uh, is he a good writer? <laughs> a real writer? <laughs> and then uh, with the support of uh, James Joyce he could come uh, to Switzerland uh, safely. So it's interesting, many uh, German writers could leave uh, Germany during, before the Nazi strong government. Uh, so the, the right uh, pan system helped that time also then uh, to arrange locations in the United States. Uh, Stavans Zweig went to uh, Latin America and suicide there. And Benjamin had to kill himself at the border, many uh, events. Uh, only von Ossietsky uh, died in prison, exactly. but many writers could leave because of that system. Now, it, there is a, in Icorn is better than this system uh, because uh, Icorn reach also uh, living area uh, for the writers in problem in the world, uh, so they can go on uh, to write uh, in peace. It's very important to feel peace for writing as a, a creative writing. Uh, perhaps not everyone here knows what ICON stands for. It's it's a fundamental.
foundation run out of Stavanger in Norway. Uh, and ICORN stands for International uh, Cities of Refuge Network, that's ICORN. And uh, they offer up a possibility for persecuted writers to live somewhere else in the world for two years and write and, and get a very, very small salary as well. Uh, Sweden was about to become one of the best countries in this system. We are, we're going from four cities, and if uh, things hadn't been become a bit complicated, we could have been 15 cities next year. Yes, so they are going to go. Yes, but now there is an opposition from some politicians, mm -hmm. uh, notably in Gävle, who has actually dragged the system to the court and said this is unconstitutional for a city to join this system. So there is, for the first time now, a political opposition to Sweden, Swedish cities joining this system. But Sigtuna, of course, I'm, I'm happy to say, have really, really done their part and, and not least invited you as a guest here. Yes, uh, Sigtuna is a very important, uh, what I said, one of the centers of the intellectual center of the Sweden, uh, the heritage. So uh, these foundations are institutions. I, I found it quite interesting what you said about all these famous writers being sort of part of a solidarity system in the past and also being persecuted. And some of you might have heard me say this before, but uh, as you know, the Swedish Academy publishes a poster every year with the Nobel Prize laureates with the portraits. And uh, I took one of those with a um, little red pen and I put a mark under all the writers, the famous writers, who had been persecuted by the government or had been had to flee yeah. uh, from an invasion or something. And it turned out to be about between one third and half of all the Nobel laureates had had some kind of political persecution in, in their lives. And this goes from Alexander Solzhenitsyn to Hertha Müller, to Sigrid Unset, not yeah. everybody knows that she had to flee from the Nazi occupation of Norway. So perhaps we should tie this up just to say a few words about the deep connections between serious literature and freedom of speech, because as chairman of Swedish PAN, I think uh, it has been so, been so clear to me in these last few years that the real serious-minded literature is always dangerous to totalitarian thinkers. I'd like to hear your comment. Yes, I was, uh, as a uh, Turkish uh, writer, I was very happy when uh, Nobel Committee declared uh, Nobel Prize uh, for Orhan Pamuk because that period uh, his life was in danger and he was going around like someone wished to be the guards. And uh, when Nobel Committee uh, published the declaration Instead of uh, joy yeah. in the Turkey, there was sadness. How they could give <laughs> a traitor a prize. But after 10 years, Turks began to be pride, feel uh, pride because of Orhan Pamuk. So it's good. It's, it's always like that. I mean, somebody would think that a serious novelist like Orhan Pamuk, his, his novels are, I like his novels, uh, but they're not the easiest type of reading, you could say, you write such complicated stuff, you let's put it on the shelf up there and nobody will look at it. Mm -hmm. But instead he annoys uh, the government so much. And I think that's very interesting. I think, uh, sure, uh, Nobel uh, Committee decided to give a word uh, for Han Pong because of his life uh, in danger or uh, he has problems. There are so many people, but I think something helped with the Turkish government policy. Uh, they notice uh, Orhan Pamuk and uh, they begin to read Orhan Pamuk. Oh, they see oh, he's a good writer. <laughs> so he, uh, he must be thankful to Turkish government also. Okay. <laughs> yeah, another way to uh, get the attention between many writers. That uh, reminds me of one thing that, that the East German writer Heine Müller said when he was like the third time, I think, uh, interrogated by Stasi. Yeah. Uh, and before they released him, they said, Well, Mr. Müller, you should be happy that you live in a country that takes literature seriously. <laughs> 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 so, I have one last question to you, and then we can open up for questions from the audience. Mm -hmm. uh, 
Uh, and what happens really? What happens if we don't address these cycles? What, what's, what's the danger in sort of leaving them alone? And I mean, like as a writer, if both you and me want to go there and put our finger into this sensitive stuff that you're not supposed to discuss. But what happens if you don't do that? What's the danger of leaving these silences alone? Uh, I am very proud uh, of the uh, Turkish uh, intellectual, uh, also Kurdish intellectual resistance. We have an authoritarian uh, state, but always uh, there are enough uh, courageous uh, writers, poets, uh, dare to declare their ideas, their uh, feelings, without censorship. Uh, I'm grateful to them because it was... Uh, they were my schooling. Uh, we grow up uh, with the stories of Nazım Hikmet, the big uh, Turkish poet. He was 13 years in prison. Uh, so, uh, other writers, the prisons uh, became a, a kind of uh, academy yeah. of uh, Turkish writing and Kurdish writing. Uh, so it is the uh, another side. Uh, so uh, we must uh, not uh, accept to be silent. Sometimes we can use the method of silence. I did after I released. I uh, did a silence boycott. I didn't give any uh, speech. Turkish media, and I de declare that if I accept to express uh, my feelings after releasing, it means uh, the, the government made a wrong, and after it is okay after I was released. But for me, it is not okay. And I ask why I was in prison, and I don't believe uh, Turkish press media give my ideas correctly. And then six months I uh, talked to only foreign uh, press like uh, Frankfurt, Algemeine Zeitung, Lamont and others, or Turkish, uh, Kurd uh, English uh, newspaper in Turkey, Daily News. Uh, also, one side uh, why I was in resistance of silence because of uh, the attitude of Turkish courts. They didn't accept uh, defenses in Kurdish. So it was a basic right, uh, lang linguistic right. And they were in resistance in the uh, Turkish courts. And uh, I want also to be uh, in solidarity with them without using my uh, uh, beloved uh, mother language, Turkish. I didn't use my mother language because I felt shameful. Because, but after these two and a half years resistance of uh, Kurdish prisoners, the uh, government had to accept uh, the right, uh, defense right in mother language in Kurdish. So after I uh, stopped my silence boycott by Isaac Babe in Turkey's and Soviet Union. So now you're using the Turkish language again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But do we have any questions from the audience to Raghib Sarkono? Because he has a lot more stories to tell, I think. So feel free to... Thank you. Um, I've, been, I've been now in uh, Turkey for one year and I'm, I'm, I'm struggling very much to put what you say in perspective and, and, and you helped me a lot. Uh, I, I think, I, as I see it, it's very much a struggle now between conservatism slash is Islamism. Mm -hmm. uh, what is what is not totally clear to me, but there is really a return of a lot of the masses of the of the of the countryside with, with traditions that now have some some kind of aspiration for power and actually do vote for Erdogan. Um, there is still a majority, even if it wasn't that big, as we probably have had wished. So there is this this ma this uh, mainstream coming, and at the same time, as you said. Uh, um, leaving aside minorities, which is extremely important, but looking at liberalism, I think, I think what you have said also is that uh, some of the first years of the AK party at power were actually the most liberal pluralist years, in, in a sense also. Mainly, mostly, and still, 
also when it comes to minorities for the Kurdish people, their rights are, 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 are still there. There's a big discussion within the Kurdish community what next steps to take and what more to ask for. They have wind in their sails also, don't they, in, in some other areas, in Iraq and so forth. <coughs> so it's really, a, it's really a struggle. Has it always been like that? I mean, you must be, you've been through all these kind of emotions and now it's turning into something new. Uh, is there a resilience? Is there a, a point where actually this struggle between conservatism, nationalism, conservatism, pluralism will, will kind of find its, its medium level? Yes. Uh, you remind me, thank you. Uh, I'm very tired uh, because of the, the, to observe these uh, developments because uh, as uh, Turkish society, we are hopeful for democracy beginning uh, with the 1950 elections, first time Democratic Party got the power and everybody supported, the majority of the uh, people supported at the beginning uh, uh, with uh, demands of uh, democracy, uh, more democracy, more li liberalism, more liberal rights. But later, after uh, 10 years, uh, the, that so-called liberal parties transformed to authoritarian way because they didn't want to leave the, the power. Uh, this is another kind of rep reproduction of Kemalist mentality. They didn't, never wanted uh, to leave real power uh, and controlling the society. Now, uh, I, for me, it is a problem of Turkish state, not uh, the parties, not the leaders. We have, uh, like uh, Russia, strong uh, state tradition. Our problem with this state tradition. Now there is they are using an Islamist source before they use national source. Sometimes they may try so-called left source also, but uh, the core of the state uh, is going wrong. This is uh, our uh, problem. Uh, many people uh, talk about Erdogan got the power to control the state, but I believe it deeply the state got control Erdogan because he's going uh, on the same way and worse way because uh, the state has uh, every time more uh, possibilities to control the society. Mr. Erdogan was so against uh, September 12 coup d'etat politically and during his period the generals put in trial because of the push. But he always uh, get benefit uh, from uh, the authoritarianism of that generals he used for himself. So the ideas change, but the structures of power remain. In a way, yes. Unfortunately, for example, in 1991, uh, Demirel, Mr. Demirel, uh, got the, the government with the program of democratization. The same happened with Mr. Erdogan. Always we have a program of democratization. After 1960 uh, coup d'etat, there was a democratization. In 1950 elections, but also Western uh, system is responsible because of that. Because Turkey is a, a, a different kind of country in Middle East. They are part of European system. They are part of the NATO. They are part of the uh, European Conseil, one of the European states after the 50s. Uh, but uh, there wasn't enough uh, critical because they need Turkey geopolitically. So, so there is a responsibility of uh, United States especially because of going on. I think that uh, Mr. Olamda and Mr. Sarakuru should talk a little bit more about these things. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but do we have one more last question before we tie this up today? Anyone else who has got a question? Yeah, right there. Uh, do you think the Islamic rule over Turkey will be long lived or short lived? Uh, there is a danger for uh, long lived for me because uh, of uh, their building of their structures.
successful they are transforming the education system uh, for example for the uh, future generation it's uh, danger because uh, there are more and more uh, gymnasiums uh, based on religion like Catholic gymnasiums they are going more and more they are choosing down schools with another background uh, Turkey like that yes I think this is quite quite a long day with a long program for many of us. So I think perhaps we should thank Mrs. Sarah Kudu there for this time around. And uh, of course, hope that we stay in Sikituna for a long while and write a lot of very, very sensible books. Thank you very much. I want to thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sarah Kudu. Thank you, Mr. Lost for a very important discussion together with us here. And I want to give you a flower, and I want to give you a book. And the book is made uh, by children of the part of Sikhtuna municipality that is called Valsta. And they do it every year, and we give it to all the, the, the authors or participants. And this year, it's called, very properly, uh, properly I think, um, thank you so much.